your first time buyer thinking, where do I start? Well, don't worry, you're not alone. We will point you in the right direction with our top tips. Hello, welcome back to our channel and podcast. My name is Gemma and here at WS we talk about all things relating to money, mortgages and positive money mindset. So if that interests you, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the thumbs up. It really helps with our YouTube algorithm and means that you won't miss out on any of our videos. On today's episode, let's talk money and mortgages. We have Iftika here with us. Iftika is a trained accountant and mortgage broker who has worked in the industry for over 10 years and he is also one of the founding directors here at WIS. Welcome back, Ifti. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. How are you, Gemma? I'm really good, thank you. Let's get into today's video. It's all about first-time buyers. We have a lot of first-time buyers and they always ask some really good questions. So the first question that I kind of wanted to bring up, one that we get a lot, is what do you do first? Do you find a property or do you get a mortgage? Very interesting question. I love working with first-time buyers uh, because it's always <laughs> a challenge and everybody's quite excited about buying their house and it's their first time and they need a lot of hand-holding, right? It's always a pleasure working with uh, first-time buyers. So for the question you asked, whether it's best to get a mortgage first or whether to get the house first, right? So I don't agree with both. I think people should first get agreement in principle because you sometimes need guidance because this is the first time you do it. Best to sit down with an advisor like a mortgage broker or a bank and go through your circumstances with the bank or the mortgage advisor who has access to a lot of products out there anyway. And then try to find out based on your circumstances what kind of mortgage is best for you. So then get a decision in principle based on that. Because for example, we have for standbys who are kind of in their late 40s. So they can't get a four and a half times their income type of mortgage, right? So you always yeah. need to get a decision in principle, but discuss your plans because that makes life easier. So your decision in principle can be based on what your plans are. So I think that mm -hmm. is kind of the best, best thing to do. Then obviously, once you've got a decision in principle, you can look for a house because you know what your budget is, right? But what's the loan you're going to get from the bank? Yeah. So that's all very clear at that point. So then you can look for a house and then you can make your application afterwards yeah now this decision in principle just for those people watching who don't actually know what that is do you mind just yeah. giving us a brief overview of what a decision in principle is of course a decision in principle is the banks tell you in principle how much you can borrow they'll ask what your income is what your commitments are what are your expenses so based on that they will tell you okay in principle we are willing to offer you say hundred thousand pounds so that is no guarantee until you make a full application and the bank has verified your income, expenses, your other commitments. It's no guarantee, but it's a good indication as to how much you can borrow. That's why that's a very important thing. So mm -hmm. most estate agents or developers, if you're buying a new house, will want to see this decision in principle most of the time before even talking to you because they want to see that you know you can actually afford a house so that's why it's a very important thing thanks if Jean. just a top tip for everybody sometimes it's also called an agreement in principle so you might hear like decision in principle or agreement in principle but essentially they are the same thing the next question is things to bear in mind whilst looking for a property so when i first started training to be a mortgage advisor there were loads of things that i didn't actually realize that really impacted getting a mortgage such as freehold flats or flat roofs. Do you want to talk us through some of those things? Yeah. So banks love standard stuff, right? That's very, hmm. very important for you to know. So if you got the standard brick and tiles, that's kind of what the bank prefers the most. But if you have something unusual, that's when the banks start to get a little funny because they, they are quite selective on the type of property. So it's quite important. So with houses is a little straightforward because most houses are freehold. So there is no complication and a lot of houses are standard brick and tile. So those are fine, but it becomes complicated when you go for apartments mainly, right? So if you go for apartments, what happens is most apartments in England are not on freehold. It's on a leasehold. So the starting point, a bank wants to know how long the lease is. If the lease is short, the banks shy away saying that, okay, I'm not happy to do a mortgage, right? So you have to be a little careful with that, but also with apartments, you know, after things like Grenfell Tower, banks are a little careful, right? So the taller the building is, it's more difficult to get a mortgage. So high rises are a little tricky at times. Usually we say six floors are fine, right? Some banks will go up to eight floors. 
Some even go up to 15 floors, but the taller the building, it becomes difficult to get a mortgage. So just be very mindful of that. Also, you have to look at things like sometimes banks don't like certain types of balconies. They look at the frame itself, right? Timber mm. frames, not very comfortable. Certain types of aluminum frames, they're not comfortable. A lot of people don't know this, right? Because they think, okay, there's a mortgage. Anybody will do this mortgage sort of thing. And they just carry on, right? And also another hot topic at the moment is something called EWS1. Especially with apartments, you need to have this certificate before you can get a mortgage. So just be very careful, especially if people are looking for apartments, you need to make sure that the EWS1 certificate is available, right? So that's an important thing. Also with apartments, sometimes if it's a high rise, banks like a lift, right? Because they are worried about fire hazards and things like that. So if it's a five story apartment, they will insist that there is a lift. But if it's a shorter block of flats, like two, three stories, they wouldn't insist on that. So just be mindful. It is always good to run this by a advisor because they know. Last thing you want to do is you apply with X bank and they say, you know what? We don't like uh, the type of apartment you have. That means if your credit scores are low, you may have to make another application. So you don't want to do that, right? Because second time round, your mortgage might not be affordable because your credit scores have now dropped, right? So you have to be a little careful about that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of with the apartments. But with the houses, again, like I said, standard brick and tile is what banks are generally comfortable with. So if you have things like tax cottages, right, those are like unusual. So not all banks will like it. Flat roofs uh, with houses, banks don't like it. Not everybody, but, you know, some are okay and some are not. Uh, so, you know, if you have something fancy or something quirky, those are things that banks may not feel comfortable with, right? So you have to be a little careful with those. Always run it by a broker before you do application, right? Because otherwise, application likely to get rejected and it might affect your credit scores, right? Also, yeah. things like the area, right? Now, for example, certain areas are more prone to floods than the others. If it's in a, a area which is likely to flood, banks will stay away, right? So be very careful about those things because it's difficult to get mortgages on those sort of properties. So you want to stay away from that. Also, if you're close to hazardous business, it sometimes becomes a problem. We had a client who was trying to buy a house on top of a bakery, right? So the bank didn't like it because they said there's a fire hazard, right? Also, there was a building shop, a street next to one of the houses that we are looking at. The bank didn't like it. Now, these kind of things, first time buyers wouldn't know, right? Because they think it's just a house, right? Always speak to the advisor, send them the links, ask them to see whether the banks are happy with the property itself before you apply. So yes, so property type can have a, a impact on the mortgage for sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks Ifti. I had just another thought about this DIP. Hmm. So let's just go back to that yeah. for a second because I'm sure people are wondering, documentation, what do I need to apply for a DIP? Do they need any documentation? Good question. The answer is no, you don't need documentation for a decision in principle. You actually don't, right? But saying that, I'll always <laughs> say take some documents because what happens is a lot of our clients, we ask, okay, so how much do you earn? They say, okay, I earn 25,000, right? But 25,000, if you take the pay slip itself, yes, they are earning 25, they're not lying, but there is deductions, right? Sometimes banks don't like those deductions. There could be student loans because they're just uh, students a few years ago and now they're working and they're earning 25,000. So those come as deductions and that affects your affordability. So if you are doing a decision in principle and you're not giving the exact details, then the amount that you can borrow will change, right? And it's it will change for the worst. Yeah. And the last thing you want is, you know, you go and find a property, you like it, you make offer based on the decision in principle and the bank turns around and say, you know what, you got a deduction. So therefore we can give you 5,000 pounds less. But that really puts you back because you'll have to probably go and borrow money from family or something like that, right? Which is not the best situation to be in. So you, you don't need documents, but show things like your pay slips, show your advisors, your bank statements, because they can look at it because banks look at things like your expenses, right? So if you have expensive hobbies, banks don't like it. So yeah. do show that before you get a decision in principle. Otherwise, your decision in principle is just a piece of paper and it doesn't really carry much value, right? So so you have mm. to be very careful with those things, yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks, Ifti. And that kind of leads on to my next question about how much can I borrow? Because I feel like that's another thing that first-time mm. buyers yeah. always need help with. Like, how much can I borrow? How does the affordability work? So do you want to just talk us through that a little bit? Yeah. So banks mainly look at four things to decide on how much you can borrow. So they look at your income. If somebody's working as a permanent employee, they look at pay slips, right? And if you are mm. self-employed, 
you're looking at your tax returns which we call SA 302s and also if you're a contractor they look at your contracts so that's kind of your income side of it right be very clear on your income side divulge to your advisor as much as possible because I always say garbage in garbage out right so if you give the wrong details mm -hmm. your results going to be different right you can have secondary income as well this is things that sometimes people miss out because they have the income from you know doing a small part-time self-employment job or something like that right so you can always disclose that sometimes things like child benefits right some people don't know some yeah. banks take that as an income because obviously that's coming from the government and it's kind of guaranteed right uh, so that mm -hmm. can be classified as income as well so you can add those things with certain banks right so that is one thing they look at then your expenses right so banks generally assume uh, most people have kind of normal expenses right they, they pay the council tax the water the gas and of course a small element of entertainment and your food but if you have a fancy lifestyle that could be considered as a commitment because banks say okay irrespective of what you know if you're spending say 500 pounds on entertainment every month uh, which okay. if the bank perceives that's to be too much, they will put that down as a commitment, right? So they look at your expenses. So be very careful with your expenses. Usually yeah. the banks look at your last three months bank statement. The third thing they look at is your financial commitments, right? So your financial commitments are like loans and credit cards. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you have to pay 300 pounds a month on a loan, the bank says, okay, so you can afford a 2000 mortgage, but you got to pay 300 pounds to another bank. So therefore we can't give you a mortgage where you can pay 2000 pounds a month we'll only give you 1700 so you got to be yeah. very careful and the one that gets a lot of people is credit cards right because credit cards a lot of people say oh i've got a credit card zero percent you know that's why i took it it's it's great i don't intend to pay that back immediately because i've got one year to go or whatever it is it's great it's there for a reason but obviously from a mortgage point of view it doesn't work because that is a loan and that's yeah. payable on call right so you've got to be a little careful with those so mm -hmm. that can have an impact as well. So those, that's the third one. And the fourth thing is your credit status itself, right? So obviously if you had yeah. mispayments or bad credit history, that can be negative. Mm -hmm. So assuming all these things are kind of normal, like a standard application, bank will give you four and a half times your income. Most banks will give you four and a half. Before the sort of pandemic, some of the banks gave you even up to about five and a half times your income. But that has slowed down a little bit now because of the pandemic. If you are a very high income earner, sometimes banks can go up to about five times your income. So there are a few banks which are still a little flexible. But for most people, you're looking at about four and a half times your income. So that's a safe number to go with provided mm -hmm. you know those four conditions are kind of met right okay thanks Ifti. just a little uh, pointer we actually do have another video that goes into why you might be declined for a mortgage like credit searches all that kind of information so if you do want to know more about that be sure to check out that video i'll leave the link below okay so you've got the dip you've found the house now what yeah very important okay <laughs> What's so next first step? yeah i mean the first thing the estate agent is going to ask you is do you have a solicitor right Okay, now don't compromise on solicitors. I tell this to a lot of people, right? Because yeah. people look at solicitors online, go for the cheapest quote. Unfortunately, <laughs> in solicitors world, it doesn't work that way, right? Yeah. Get the best solicitor possible because mm -hmm. they are the ones who are going to go through your title to see whether it's all clean. They are the ones who are going to point out if there's any issues from a legal point of view. So mm -hmm. you don't want a rush job there. You want somebody who will do that job properly. So don't compromise on solicitors. Obviously, ask your advisors. They will know good solicitors because they know through yeah. their experience. Or if you have friends who are solicitors or somebody who recommends a solicitor very heavily, you might as well use them. But select the right solicitor because there are a lot of solicitors who are not real solicitors. They are like conveyances. Legally, they can do the job, but they might yeah. not do the job properly. right? So you need a good solicitor. If the property is old, right, you might need a survey. Uh, quite often banks do their survey free, but it's a basic survey. But if the house mm. is a little old, I strongly suggest you do a, a proper survey. Don't rely on the bank survey because the bank will only tell you whether the property is worth what you're paying, right? But they won't say, yeah. okay, that's a potentially a problem or this is definitely a problem, right? So mm. there are big issues like subsidence or the houses move sort of problems, which you and I wouldn't spot, right? but the survey mm -hmm. would, right, if there's any potential issues. So old houses, I'd suggest that you do that. New houses are a little bit more safer because obviously you've got the warranties and all that with the new houses, but with yeah. the old one, definitely you want to look at survey. So get those things mm -hmm. uh, lined up. 
Uh, again, your advisors are good. They can help you with this, right? Because advisors always try to help clients and make things as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, select a good advisor who can guide you because you are, remember, you are a first time buyer, right? So you need help, right? So you need the right people yes. to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, you should be able to talk to somebody and say, look, I've got this problem. What can I do sort of thing, right? So somebody to handhold you. And also look at an advisor who's kind of digitally driven because this is quite important to speed up your application. You know, there are advisors who can help you, but sometimes it's a very manual process. If you have to post them your bank statements and if you have to go to the post office to get your passport verified, it can slow down your application process, right? So the best thing yeah. to do is Work with a digital mortgage broker who can verify your bank statements digitally. They'll allow you using open banking to download the bank statements. You know, it speeds up the process and it's obviously it's efficient. We all want things which are efficient, right? We don't want to waste time mm -hmm. posting stuff for scanning stuff. So I think those are the three next steps that you have to be a little mindful. So get those things ready. I mean, plan these up front, right? So, uh, so that will be very helpful. Yeah, thanks, Tiffany. The next question kind of relates back to the, the dip. So you've got the dip. After, you also need to get the solicitor, which we've talked about, but then you kind of, you do need to actually go back to the mortgage advisor, don't you, to, to talk about the actual mortgages that are available to you and make an application. Do you want to talk more about the kind of mortgages that are available for first-time buyers? Okay, I think this is a very good time for first-time buyers. Yeah. Obviously, the last year or so has been difficult times for first-time buyers because the banks increased the minimum deposit amounts for mortgages up to about 15%, which was very difficult for a lot of first-time buyers to say. So the good thing is there's a lot of 5% deposit mortgages which have come up and the government back 5% mortgage scheme is also there, right? Uh, which is not really too different to the normal 5% deposit mortgages. So yeah. a combination of both has kind of given a lot of choice for first-time buyers now, right? So that is very, very helpful. And then on top of that, uh, you got the help to buy scheme as always. That's still out there for people who are looking to buy a new property. So the help to buy scheme is there. That's still live and you can use that scheme as well. Also, don't forget things like the lifetime ISIS, right? Because that gives you 25% deposit uh, towards your new property based on your savings, right? So. Uh, so if you save 4,000 pounds, the government gives you 1,000 pounds, right? So that is money you never had and you suddenly get that, right? So those are some incentives for you. I mean, I was talking to one of my old friends. He's looking to buy a property in Newcastle for 100,000 pounds, right? So he's trying to save 5%. He has 4,000 pounds, right? So with that, 1,000 pounds they get, right? So that's 1,000 pounds. They only need to have that 4,000, right? So instead of having 5,000 at the 5% as a deposit, they now need only 4,000 because 1,000 pounds from, comes from the government, right? So don't miss out on schemes like that. It's always very helpful. Also, there's the shared ownership schemes as well, right? Obviously, it has its pros and cons, but it is a nice initiative for some people to get into the property ladder because with shared ownership scheme, you, are, you own only part of the property and the other part is with the housing association. But mm -hmm. those mortgages are a little bit more easier. So that is also out there. So that's an option for first time buyers. Yeah, yeah, that's good. In terms of the actual rates themselves, mm -hmm. how do they compare against other rates? Do you pay more when you're a first time buyer? Okay, generally not because most lenders don't discriminate uh, between a first time buyer and a home mover sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So generally it, it is not. But in the past, I found there is a different rate that's applicable for first time buyers. Mm -hmm. But banks, along with that, they sometimes offer incentives which they don't offer a home mover. So, for example, a bank, you know, if they were charging 2%, they used to have a first time buyer rate of 2.1%, but they used to give a cashback of 500 pounds. So they used to give free legals. So the packaging might be slightly different as well at times, but mm -hmm. usually 90% of the time, there's no discrimination. Everybody gets the mm -hmm. same sort of rate. So yeah, so you're not at a disadvantage uh, because a lot of banks like to help out first-time buyers. Uh, yeah. And of, of course, the government is backing uh, first-time buyers to come into the market as well. So that's kind of very helpful. So yeah. you will get uh, decent rates mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Right. But in terms of like the loan to value, is there a correlation with a high loan to value ratio and the rates being more expensive? Yeah, so obviously if you're going for a 5% deposit, your loan to value is 95%, right? So with those, interest rates are generally on the higher side for sure. So you end up paying more on those sort of products, right? 
But if you have bigger deposits, then you're kind of in line with some of the home movers and so on and so forth. So always, you know, the lower the deposit, the interest rate is going to be high. At present, it's hovering around 4% for somebody who has a 5% deposit mortgage, right? You know, after two years, if the house prices have gone up, you automatically are going to be in the next bracket, right? So that really helps yeah. you. So then you might have 10% or 15% deposit on the house. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for a lot of people, it's just that stepping stone, right? So that's the important thing. Yeah, yeah thanks, 50. The next question that we get a lot is about stamp duty and do I still have to pay stamp duty as a first time buyer? If you're lucky, up to 30th June, 500,000 is stamp duty free for a first time buyer. Before the stamp duty holiday, first time buyers were allowed 300,000 stamp duty free anyway. So mm-hmm. after June, I think that will still continue to be there because 300,000 will be stamp duty free if you're a first time buyer, which is always helpful. Yeah. Of course, if you're buying a property more than that, after June, you'll have to pay stamp duty. So that will kind of be at about 5%. But yeah, if you're a first time buyer looking for a property up to 300,000, you won't have a problem getting stamp duty free, right? But it's only more than that, that you will have to start paying stamp duty after June. But up to June, mm-hmm. 500,000 stamp duty free, which is like massive thumbs up for first time buyers for sure. Yeah. Okay. The next question, which is maybe to a lot of other people that have purchased property seems like an obvious one, but I think for yeah. first time buyers, do I own the property when I exchange or when I complete? That's a very, very good question. I think a lot of people <laughs> get confused around that. So what happens is with this process, your house towards the end, just before you get the keys, you have something called the exchange. If somebody asks me what an exchange is, I said that's the point at which you can't go back anymore, right? So at that mm-hmm. point, generally the solicitor says, okay, I want 10% deposit. Of course, if it's a 5% mortgage, they will take your 5%. And there's no going back from that point, right? So you're committing that you're going to buy the house. So legally, you're not really the owner of the house at that stage, but you're committed to buy the house. Irrespective of what, you have to make it happen. If not, you will lose your deposit that you make, right? Plus the sellers and if there's a chain, the other people involved in the chain also can make claims. That's why I said, you know, no going back from that point, right? (laughs) So point of no return. (laughs) uh, Definitely point of no return. So you have to be 100% sure that you can complete it, right? So that is exchange. Now, the important thing about exchange is at this point, the responsibility of the house kind of falls on your shoulder as well, right? So if you are getting a home insurance, get one at this point, right? Mm-hmm. Because usually between exchange and completion, there isn't much of a gap, right? Solicitors don't like gaps because a lot of things can happen during that time mm-hmm. period. So get your yeah. home insurance and please make sure you have a life insurance in place, right? Life insurance, a lot of people tell me, oh, it's not compulsory, I don't need this. But you do need this. Say, you know, two partners are buying the house, right? If one partner yeah. d- dies between exchange and completion, the other partner has to make sure that the mortgage is paid, mm-hmm. right? So you need to make sure you have your life insurance in place at that yeah. point. But completion is, that's kind of it. Really. That's when you actually get the keys. So legally you become the owner, uh, the bank yeah. transfers the mortgage money and things like that. So that's the point at which it's, it's all done, right? So legally you become owner at that point, yeah. Yeah, okay. And the last question I've got is, how long does the whole process take? <laughs> oh, very good question. And I wish I had a straightforward answer to that. And it's not. <laughs> okay, so generally, if it's a very straightforward transaction, I've heard a lot of people say that you can get it done in four weeks, right? For that to happen, everything has to be in order <laughs> and everything has to go yeah. very smoothly, right? I mean, I don't see that happen very regularly, right? It rarely happens. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, that's right. I think uh, if it's a straightforward transaction, you're probably looking at six weeks. But at this stage, we are, we are not still completely out of this pandemic, right? So you have to sort of factor those things. A lot of solicitors work from home. So, you know, documentation, paperwork can take a little longer. Then surveys are busy. And also, you know, because of the restriction, they can't just easily just walk into a house and do a survey. So those things take yeah. a little longer. So you have to give a little longer now, right? Uh, unlike before. Uh, so six weeks is kind of a realistic number. But the problem is if there's a chain, right? A chain is where, you know, somebody is selling to somebody who is buying another property and the other person might be selling the property and buying another property. So that can cause a chain, right? So if it is a chain, it's kind of open-ended. You don't know when you're going to complete, (laughs) right? 
it, yeah. it moves as fast as the slowest person in the chain that's what i always say right so you can't give a straightforward answer on that one unfortunately yeah yeah okay well thank you so much again if for all of your great advice i just wanted to put a reminder out there that these points may or may not be applicable to all borrowers so please do talk to an advisor if you're unsure if any of these points are suitable for you i will leave our ws contact details below because um, as you know we're always happy to help and we also give free advice and we charge zero fees a little reminder that a mortgage is secured against your home or property so it may be repossessed if you do not keep up with the mortgage repayments and thank you again for joining us today uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of let's talk money and mortgages have a great day stay safe and we'll see you again soon Thank you.